Welcome to the Tech Story Podcast, a place where we interview founders and interesting people in tech. Today, I'm very excited to welcome Paul Ford on the show. Paul is the founder and CEO of ASIN, a platform which helps financial institutions digitize their operational risk. Thank you, Paul, for taking the time for being with us. Would you like to share a bit of background about yourself and ASIN? Brilliant. Well, thank you very much for, for having me. It's a, it's a pleasure to be on the show. Firstly, a little bit about myself. So I uh, started my career in the military. So I was a, a, an army officer, an engineer, uh, which meant that I used to build things and blow stuff up. Hopefully I now build things rather than blow stuff up. And then my career has involved consulting uh, and banking. So I was a chief operating officer at a few banks. Uh, and then 13 years ago, I left to set up my own uh, business, which was originally a consulting business. Uh, and then in 2017 to 2018, uh, I founded ASIN, which is a risk analytics uh, platform for managing operational risk across some of the world's biggest banks. And what sort of led to selling the company? Did it just happen through your consulting that you identified the opportunity? Where did the idea come from? So I started the first business as a consulting business, and the aim was to work with CROs in banks, so chief, chief operating officers. That's what I've done. Uh, and it was really, so it was called Anchura, and Anchura meant bandwidth in Spanish, so it was whatever their agenda was. By 2016, 2017, all the work we, was do, we were doing was in operational risk. And, and then what actually happened was, um, it is very difficult to run a consulting business, you've got to sell all your work every year, it's getting very competitive. And so took a look and said, actually, we know this market really well but let's change the business model. So, so actually we created ASIN as a uh, data and technology solution to the problem, uh, as opposed to doing it on a consulting basis. So um, that didn't quite happen overnight, and, uh, uh, but through a sort of process of R&D and working it out. And I was very familiar with some other business models and businesses in this sector. So there's one particular one called Coalition Greenwich, and they do revenue benchmarking, cost benchmarking, RWA benchmarking for banks. And I knew the founder, in fact, the current, the, the former CEO is one of our shareholders and advisors, and we've got a few of their, their team on board now. So that was the kind of concept. Uh, and then really um, just started, you know, building that back up from there. And then, you know, today we've got 65 people, some of the world's biggest banks as both shareholders and clients. So. Congratulations and uh, changing a business model is always quite daunting, yeah. uh, but can be really transformational for the business. And yeah. it seems like you found the right one. So yeah, it's kind of painful. Yeah, but um, you know, it's one of these things where you've, you know, you put a lot of blood, sweat, and tears into any business, as I'm sure you know. Uh, and then when you get to a point and you realise that that is has worked but is no longer going to work going forwards and you need to find something else and i remember having this this discussion i talked to lots of people but i have having this discussion with a, a a kind of an advisor who i knew and he said look paul you know you you can either keep throwing yourself at the past uh, or you can accept and acknowledge the future and there was this kind of moment of clarity for me that actually instead of kind of trying to hang on to something that was you know, really almost run its time uh, and to embrace the new. And then I think once you've kind of crossed that chasm, then there was a kind of renewed energy and, and drive to kind of move on with what we've got. So. You know, I can somewhat relate. We, we also changed our business model from a usage base to a uh, subscription-based model. And I'd say we were definitely in the chasm of yeah. that transition, saying goodbye to some previous clients or yeah. onboarding or transitioning clients. And um, yeah, we, we have quite experienced success that you have yet, but hopefully we will. Yeah, I'm sure it'll come. So. Great. And um, through your journey um, as an entrepreneur and, I guess, founder of ASIN, what's, what's been your favourite moment so far? I think there are lots of little ones. You know, I always say to the team, that my greatest joy is when things happen that I've had nothing to do with, positive things happen that I've had nothing to do. Because that means the kind of team and the, the system is, is working. But if I had to pick out one thing it would be uh, you know last year we raised a series b from actually five banks so jp morgan city bnp parabar lloyds and barclays as a strategic round and it wasn't the it wasn't the fundraising thing, although that clearly is you know is very important as you grow it was the endorsement of those five banks that kind of uh, signal from the market and to the market that ASIN was here to stay as part of the infrastructure of the financial system and so i think 
that kind of level of endorsement was really my kind of favourite sort of proudest moment. But still on a day to day, the thing that brings me joy is watching, you know, little or big things happen that other people have done that I've had no involvement in. Yeah, well, I guess congratulations on working with Thank the you. biggest banks. And when you work with the biggest banks, what's next? I mean, uh, more, more banks. So, so obviously they're shareholders now, sitting our board and all those good things. Um, so we've, you know, in total, we work with 15 of the biggest banks. There are 30 globally um, significant influence banks, the GSIB. So we want to work with the majority of those. We want to work with the next 20 or 30 banks uh, down in terms of size and influence. And then we see that really gives, we become part of the fabric of the industry. We become that infrastructure about operational risk in the way that firms like S&P or Fitch, who's a shareholder, um, or Moody's are, are the fabric of credit risk, or IHS market now part of S&P is part of the fabric of market risk or the exchanges. So um, it's really extending our kind of footprint and then moving on to things like insurance. And there's no reason why we couldn't do what we do in healthcare or any other regulated industry. So it seems like the, the vision is quite big then beyond just finance. It can be operational risk is something that any bit of business anywhere has. And then I guess it's identifying the, the company sizes and industries where the operational risk is the greatest? Yeah, so I mean, every business has operational risk. You have it, we have it. Um, you know, this office building has it. Uh, and we've started in financial services. Actually, we've started in investment banking, trading and sales. We now cover corporate investment banking, retail banking. So we can almost do the whole of a big bank. Um, by the end of the year, we will be able to do the whole of a big bank. But And so we need to focus on execution around that. But the bigger vision is that we can do this across any regulated industry. In fact, a couple of years ago, we did a pilot with some uh, some NHS hospitals. They won't ever know we did it. We just found their risk information. It was publicly available on their websites. And we aggregated that and did the analytics, which is what we do with the banks today and found that we saw very similar characteristics and patterns. But it's that balancing the vision with the need to execute. So so for us, really, the focus at the moment is on that execution piece. By having the banks invest, we think that we've essentially retired a lot of the market and the product risk in, in ASIN, but we've really got to focus on the execution now. And so um, getting that right, making sure the team's kind of built out and cap- capable of doing all those things. So. Yeah, well, I mean, um, your your Series B was a big success, so um, especially in the current climate. Yeah. So, um, real endorsement of the the company and, and the product. Yeah, thank you. What do you wish you'd known before starting ASIN? So, I think having run a consulting business before, which is very overtly a people business, the thing I thought that was going to happen as we moved to a kind of product business based on technology and data, I thought that people aspect of it would become less important um, because the people weren't the product. And actually, the thing that I've realised to my, you know, when I look back on it to my naivety now is that it's really all about the people. Uh, I was talking to a, another entrepreneur the other day who said, I don't know if he'd made this up or he was quoting someone else, he said, there, of all the problems that you have uh, in a startup or a scale-up, he says, there are people problems and there are problems that you don't yet realise are people problems, and so I think that's the that's the bit that actually it's it's you know bringing together a, a team of of people and getting them to do um, to to execute extraordinary things against that vision. That's what kind of really matters. The people don't become the product, but they're still no less vital. And so if I could wind back time five years ago, I think I'd put myself straight on on uh, the people challenge versus the the people as product. Yeah, yeah, I can definitely relate to people being the biggest challenge. And, yeah. um, we're a much smaller company and now a team of 16, but transitioning from 8 to 16 has been really painful yeah. because of, even though we've only doubled, but still quite yeah. small, the, the people element is something which is really difficult um, to nail. So I guess what, sort of tips can you give for founders or people officers hiring, growing the team? I think one of the things that I've seen, this is a sort of advantage of sort of having built and scaled a business and then kind of doing it for the second time, is that you, it's all about letting go uh, as, a, as a founder. You start and it's kind of you or, you know, one or two people. 
And so you do everything by default. So I kind of sometimes joke that I've done every job that exists from ordering the stationery to selling to whatever else it might be. And it's not quite true now with a technology business. But um, but you start with that. And actually what makes you really good is your drive, your kind of energy to kind of bring something into the world that didn't exist before and to tackle a big problem. But over time, that kind of fights against you. You know, actually, you've got to let go. When... Um, one of the best advices I ever got as a parent um, was when my daughter was 13 and I did a parenting course. So it was me and 19 mums on this uh, course. And the psychologist who did it, he said, look, your sons and daughters are 13 now. And in five years' time, they're going to be 18 and they're going to go to university or work or whatever it is. Uh, when are you going to let go? Because if you let go too early, they'll crash and burn. If you let go too late, they're not prepared for the big wide world or for you know, that university or life experience. And I think that startups are like that, that you have to learn to let go. If you let go too soon and give up too many things too quickly, then it falls over. But if you don't let go, if you let go too late, the team don't understand how to to take that up and people get very frustrated that, that you're micromanaging. And I think that learning that balance is one of the most kind of important skills. I'm slightly fortunate in that my military experience, is, people think the army is very hierarchical, which of course it has ranks, but it's all about empowering people to the lowest level, that, the, the concept of mission command. So I I use that. So I, I kind of couple my military experience with my parenting experience with the kind of startup experience, but it's all about doing less, empowering more, and resisting the urge to interfere. And, that, and that's that's why I say that the greatest joy is when people do things that I've had nothing to do with, because that's really the only test that things are working. Yeah, so uh, I'm, I'm not a parent yet, so, yeah. um, but I guess um, now I'm wishing I um, had been on a similar course or been through the military, because mm. as you find that letting go is something that I find a challenge as a founder. But um, the other challenge that I have sometimes is I want to let go, but the yeah. question is, who do I let go to? Yeah. What if they're already busy and you're resource constrained and you can't necessarily hire? Yeah. What, what do you do? Do you just still do it? Or? Yeah, it's, 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 I don't think there's an easy answer. It's, it's a real balance. And you, I, I think that people will take on, the right people will take on more than you expect. Um, but I think they look at you to see, should they take it? And I've had to-do lists and sort of be felt overwhelmed at times. And then actually, you just step away from it and then parcel it out to people who will take it willingly and they see that as a as a growth opportunity and kind of grab that uh, and develop. So I think it's easy to see it from your own lens and actually sharing that with other people and kind of like, how do we do this? Be- the right people will take it. And I think you start to then see those are really the people who are going to drive the company forward. Those that are watching you or allowing you to do that, um, uh, you know, a uh, 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 not you know, perhaps those people who are going to be on the journey. Um, Steve Schwartzman, the founder of Blackstone, has got a great book, and he there's an audio book version of it. He reads himself a few of the chapters, and it's a brilliant one on entrepreneurship. And um, you know, he talks about you know when you start a company, you are happy to have anyone come with you of quality, and uh, but yeah. As you start to develop, you realise that some people just aren't cut out for it. You know, the, the thing he describes is, he said, is an American football analogy. He said, some people are like wide receivers with hands of stone. You just throw the ball, it bounces off. Other people have hands of glue, they, they catch it. And it's kind of that, it, you've, you've got to constantly iterate the bringing those people of quality in who you, he, what he describes as you can give them the difficult tasks to do and they they go away and, and do them versus people who will let you stay up all night with two or three other people doing the work that they really should be doing. And I think it's that you're constantly changing. You know, a startup and a scale-up, what it is today is not what it is in three months. I mean, a three months in this environment is like a year or a year and a half in a big company. And I think... You've kind of got got to be constantly thinking about that cycle of renewal. Someone who was, you know, good enough six months ago may not be good enough today, and then it's time for them to go and do something different, and for the business to have different um, people and characteristics in it. Yeah, I can definitely relate. I mean, 
growing the team, well, the, the people that you start with, yeah. who are very grateful that they've joined you because yeah. um, ultimately they're, they're taking a bet and a risk on you. But um, yeah. um, as a company grows, then they might not be cut out. And yeah. um, then it's about how can it grow? Or and it's tough. That's, yeah. that's really tough. I find that it's tough emotionally. And, and Schwartzman talks about it. He says, look, as a decent person, you think your job is to kind of coach the the lower performers, poor performers along, but actually in a small company environment, you just don't have, you don't have the ability to do that. You do in a big company, you can move people and train them, and a longer time horizon, you just don't have that. And so, it can sound callous or ruthless, but it's not. It's that's just what it takes. Mm-hmm. In fact, that's, I think that's the title of his book, "What It Takes." Yeah, so, yeah. I think I'll I have to read that book. Yeah. But, um, yeah. Great piece of advice and. When it comes to your operational risk, um, does legal or contracts fall under that? So obviously, we contract with the with the banks, yeah. um, and there's there's a lot of risk between us and the banks from handling data to all of those things that that, that we have to do. But yes, in um, you know, for banks, third party supplier management, that risk is a huge risk for banks. You know, they've and asset managers and others, they've outsourced a lot of things to other organisations, and that. That supply chain uh, has to be look, looked at, and uh, and you know all large organisations can be you know surprisingly inefficient in these things. So. Yeah, no, I mean um, I think legal is, is just one of those domains where it's uh, inefficient by design yeah. for risk management purposes sometimes. Yeah, um, but, but I guess that's something that we're, we're trying to. Yeah, interesting. In a lot of legal contracts, and I think back to our investment documents, they're all identifying risks and putting controls in that's what we do operationally you know you're you're putting you know there are risks that you know founders might hire their friends and pay them lots of money so you have controls against that in terms of what sort of salaries you can pay and you know relatives and all those things everything is about identifying risks and putting controls in place and that's very analogous to what we do with with the banks they just have a very wide remit of things that they do and of course, it's then every time something new happens, how does that get shared around? I think in the legal industry, people start to, you know, it gets written into model docs like the BBCA docs or those sorts of things, you know, or, or using firms like yours. And so it's that kind of sharing and improving of that balance between managing and mitigating risk, but not stopping people from doing business. And that's that's a lot of what we do is try to find that balance between risk management and the risk effectiveness and risk efficiency. Yeah, I think um, ultimately, yeah, efficiency is, everyone wants efficiency, yeah. but, um, but it's making sure that the controls that yeah. um, ultimately guarantee that the efficiency is the right efficiency. Yeah. Because um, too often we, we see founders sign contracts and it's very efficient, yeah. but they don't know what they've signed. <laughs> <laughs> no, and, that, and, yeah. and, and you see, you know, again, with large firms, they'll, there's an assumption that they've got everything covered, and then they try to make the process of doing that as cost-effective as possible and without realising they've got some big gaping holes. And, and that's what you see in the industry uh, is periodic very large risk events uh, where for banks have lost billions and that's indirect losses and fines but you can also then see the knock-on effects in terms of their share price distraction regulatory trust is eroded um the, or you know all of those those factors and so you've got to be able to balance that um you know that risk identification and understanding do i do i know the risk that i'm taking and then how do I make that as efficient as possible? Otherwise, it's a little bit of a, a false economy. You're, you think you're efficient, you just, you know, it's a bit like, I suppose, you know, you can buy insurance that you think is cheaper, but if the insurance company is never going to pay out or there's tons of small print, it's not really, it's false comfort. Yeah, no, absolutely. And um, you're on the Text Road podcast. Yeah. Um, so... Uh, what is your favourite tech product and it can be hardware software? I'm a big Apple fan. So, in fact, I don't own a non-Apple device. I've got uh, a couple of iMacs, one in the office, one at home, uh, a MacBook. I've got an iPhone, an iPad. We've got Apple. T- I mean, like uh, you know, I reckon somewhere if Apple's got a ranking of their best customers, I've got to be somewhere on it as a person for the number of devices I've had and bought. And I just love the... 
the kind of the the consistency of it. When I 2010, I left. Well, I was working at Barclays and then left to set up um, uh, first business. And one of my team said to me, they said, look, just buy an Apple Mac. You'll hate it for the first two months because I used to a Windows environment. And then you'll just accept that Steve Jobs was right and you will never look back. And I have to say, so I bought it and it was kind of for a while because, you know, the buttons are on different sides. And then something switched and I have to say she was entirely right. And so now I'm an entire Apple nut. And so everyone laughs at me in the office because, you know, people have a variety of things, but I am a Apple aficionado. You don't have an Apple Watch. Do so that's no well, so I so that's the only product that I've never gone with. So I bought one when they first came. The problem I have is that, you know, once you get over 40 your eyes start to go. And so I looked at the watch and I couldn't see it. So I was having to put my glasses on to look at the watch. And so I then ended up taking the, the watch out of my, um, uh, the, the phone out of my pocket. So that's the only product. I, I, I would love to have one yeah. for all the sensory type stuff. I just can't see it without my, mm-hmm. without my glasses on. And I don't need to wear my glasses for distance work. So it's kind of a, it's a yeah. you know, practical thing. And I guess you'll be getting the Vision Pro potentially. Yeah, yeah. yeah I'm, um, I think I'll sort of let the you know versions. I'm not a big game or any of that sort of stuff. So yeah, yeah. great. Well, thank you very much, Paul, for um, being on the show, and uh, best of luck conquering all the banks in the world. Yeah, no, what pleasure. Thank you very much for having me. It's been uh, it's been a delight to chat to you today. Thank you. Cheers. Great.